Вот. Э, Wherever you are, wherever you are, I hope you are blessed and doing safe. Ladies and gentlemen, greetings, family. Uh, of course, I'm tuning in. You see me without the glasses off today. But if you're looking for some opportunities, particular advertisement opportunities, then look no further at the link at the bottom to my email address. You can hit me up for advertisement opportunities. We are supporting and promoting your businesses here on this channel. You can also, if you would like to donate and subscribe to our Patreon, a link is at the bottom as well. So you have multiple ways in which you can advertise with the platform by emailing me when we go on through our live stream. You also have access to premium content, those that want to uh, C premium content that you will not find here on YouTube or Facebook or Twitter as I am uh, suspended probably by now. You guys can check out uh, the Patreon at link at the bottom. But advertisement opportunities, definitely email me, gavin.gerich1 at gmail.com for rates and for the Patreon. It is the same as the YouTube channel. It is channel gboot2786. All right. I'll holla. Peace. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another exciting edition of Random Topic Sunday, the hottest live stream here in the cosmos. I appreciate you all. If you're watching via Rumble, via X, via Facebook, and shout out to my family on X because they have shown the brother a lot of love on X. I've noticed I've gotten at least most of my uh, followers and people that watch the live stream are coming from Twitter. So, or formerly Twitter, I should say, because it's now X. So, I want to thank y'all for the support and love that y'all have given me. Uh, we're going in and we're talking about, of course, what has been the big news the last couple of days has been the passing of the 76-year-old Aaron Paul James Simpson, OJ Simpson, the Chiefs, who was a former... NFL football player, running back, everybody knows who he was, especially if you were born in the 19th. If you're 60 and up, you know who OJ is. Uh, for football reasons. Of course, if you are like me, 
or in their movies or young men. You know him probably from either one of two things, the Naked Gun movie series from the 80s and 90s, and of course the most infamous trial that they called the trial of the century. But well, was it really the trial of the century? The trial of the century versus OJ out in Los Angeles, California. And so since OJ Simpson has died, the vote the white supremacists so the suspected white and the suspected white supremacists have come out of their shells, if you want to say, or I should say come out of the ground now that OJ Simpson has passed to throw shade at the man, at his family, and also to rewrite history, which is what we're talking about. And they send in pundits like and we're going to talk about them in a minute. Stephen A. Smith, Mark Lamite Hill, and others, especially on CNN and MSNBC, to talk about the, uh, like Torrey and so forth, to talk about O.J. Simpson. Now, we're going to go in. And I want to point out something because, and what piqued my interest if you saw the thumbnail that I posted, uh, the thumbnail for today, that was an actual... Um, that was an actual cover story. The actual cover story. I have to pause it for the sec for a second. From the New York Post. This is a lot of people thought it was fake. It is not. You can actually go. I put the link in the descriptions of, for the videos. You can actually go look at it yourself and click on it. This is actually this is actually the post. And shout out to Brother Jen because Jen. Actually, if you click right here on X, you'll see that this is the actual cover story. Now, obviously, if I click on it, it's going to go to another tab you won't see. But you can and you can clearly see it's the cover story. It's uh, New York Post and you see page six there, Sports Extra. They state football star, actor, murderer, liar, OJ Simpson, 76. They say real killer is dead. And some people in the chat and uh, on the thread say that it wasn't real. I live in New York. This is real. I see people, but you can click on it. I clicked on the website. I'm looking right at it. For those that are down in this room, they got one fool that was going back and forth with Jen. I'll put it to you right here just so you can see. It is very real. I had to pause the music, so I want y'all to see how serious I'm. This is the actual website. So this is the cover of the New York Post. Now, when you see that, obviously, some of you might gasp and saying, how can they do something like that and post something so heinous and dastardly? The truth of the matter is, is that this is what the New York Post has always done, especially when it comes to black people. They've been known to throw shade at black folks and make a lot of racial remarks. And in this case with OJ Simpson, they of course were not alone in this. Uh, you know, you have others, but uh, the New York Post, they put this up and they had a history of doing this. So we should not be surprised. I'm going to show you why. If anybody gets a chance, I want you all, I've to gave you some books to read, especially on Thursday when I had, shout out to Harvey, Superboy, come on. We talked extensively because O.J. Simpson passed, obviously about the O.J. Simpson trial. And I pointed out several books for you. And I didn't mention this one book, but this is F. Lee Bailey's book. It's entitled, and I'm going to show you all, this is my library. This is my Kindle library. I'm just going to give you all a brief glimpse into what opens my psyche where my psyche is of course i have sean's books here uh i have a bunch of books here that i have but this one in particular there are several books to read these are three met best ones that you should read on oj simpson i told you about by the late steve singular called legacy of deception an investigation of mark Furman and racism in the LAPD. 
pursuit of Exhibit 35 of the, in the O.J. Simpson murder trial and in hits, Hidden Secrets by, by T.H. Johnson. And finally, and what I'm about to show you is this is F. Lee Bailey's book. Now, F. Lee Bailey was working on this book right before he passed away in 2021. It was finished right before he died. And I believe it was completed. And then they had to have one of his, uh, I believe one of his associates helped complete the book because he shortly passed afterwards. But it's called The Truth About the O.J. Simpson Trial. And that very famous picture, you see F. Lee Bailey, O.J. Simpson, and Johnny Cochran. This was when the verdict was read. After the verdict was read, that picture was taken. And those of us, this is important because we and those who have not, especially the younger generation that grew up, didn't see the O.J. Simpson trial, didn't experience it. And what the 90s were back then, being an eight-year-old boy, I remember what this was. I remember watching this case. This is the case that made me want to go to law school and be a lawyer, especially as we saw and with our own eyes how evidence was tampered with, how a racist police detective was exposed for not only for his racism, but for being a liar. And, on, and also when he took the fifth, when I asked directly if he planted evidence, you don't take the fifth. If you didn't do anything wrong, you say flat out, it's not true. No, he did not do that. But pundits like Stephen A. Smith, Mark Lamont Hill, and others, especially the New York Post, wants to ignore that. So I'm going to go right to this point here. Going back to the New York Post, this is what I was going to show you. So we should not be surprised by that article we just saw. I want you to see what F. Lee Bailey wrote in his book, The Truth About the O.J. Simpson Taste. So what a lot of people don't know is that Johnny Cochran took the case. He was not the first attorney to come in. Johnny came in later because the first attorney who showed up for the Dream Team was Bob Shapiro, Robert Shapiro. And Robert Shapiro brought in F. Lee Bailey. And soon thereafter, I believe Johnny Cochran and Carl Douglas came in of course, the other attorneys like Dershowitz and Sheck, there are a couple others. There were at least nine attorneys that O.J. Simpson had. He had money, and he had actually a million dollars he put up in a contract for his defense with Robert Shapiro. Robert Shapiro was known to be a fixer, if I'm not mistaken. He negotiated good deals. He also got, and he was known to get acquittals. He actually helped, believe it or not, he represented F. Lee Bailey and Johnny Carson at the same time when Johnny Carson and F. Lee Bailey got busted for DUI charges. That was back in the early 80s. Marsha Clark was the prosecutor, as a young prosecutor at the time, and I think some cases that Robert Shapiro had worked on, which I guess it wouldn't be a surprise if they worked together due to the fact that they all are part under the California bar and practice in the same area. It's not uncommon. But I want you to see, I'm going to zoom in. I want you to read very closely. So what happened was, and this is very important, I got to point out, is that Shapiro and F. Lee Bailey had a falling out during the trial. And even in the movie, if you watch The People versus O.J. Simpson, they talked about that. So although it was fictional in a lot of parts, that was what the case was. But someone wrote an article in the New York, I believe it was with the New York Times, where they stated that they criticized Bob Shapiro for taking a vacation. A little bit before the trial started, Judge Hito gave everybody a two-week break to go on vacation. Bob Shapiro went to Hawaii with his kids, his wife and children, and someone wrote an article about it. And thereafter, there was an, I guess, a disagreement because Shapiro accused definitely Bailey of being the one sending the columnist to write that scathing article and wanted him kicked off the team. And you can read all of this here. It says that, uh, and OJ Simpson was also involved 
And he made it clear he wanted Johnny Cochran to be the lead on his case. And Johnny also wanted the he wanted uh, F. Lee Bailey to remain because they wanted uh, I think Bob Shapiro didn't want F. Lee Bailey to stay. So this is according to F. Lee Bailey. So you see here that on January 24th, he declared, Judge Ito declared a two-week Christmas New Year hiatus to enable all parties to have a holiday breather and get ready for war. So he says here how Bob Shapiro decided to take his family on a two-week vacation in Hawaii over the break. And he did so under an assumed alias, Tony DeMilo, apparently so the family could have privacy. He fired his investigator, John McNally, whom he felt had not shown him enough respect. When McNally learned of Bob's hot Hawaii caper, he told the reporter friend with the New York Daily News, this produced a scathing article damning Shapiro for frolicking in the surf while his client was facing Armageddon. Bob's reaction to the publication of this information was to go ballistic, and the reaction intensified when at the end of 1994, I had a written comprehensive memo called Cut One Outlining Defense and how it should be presented and sent to all counsel. And... Bob called me, obviously flustered. I had planned, I had planned to give the opening statement, he said. Looks like you're handing it to Johnny. I'm not handling handing anything to anyone, I replied. OJ has made a decision with great finality on his own, which he declared at a recent meeting. You must have been at the beach. Yes, OJ declared he wanted Johnny to take the lead. Now, how does the New York Post come in? Listen to this part. At about the time, this is what F. Lee Bailey says, Cochran became chief counsel. An article appeared in the New York Post saying, quote, Black takes over lead in Simpson case. F. Lee Bailey wondered, was he referring, was the article referring to my friend, Roy Black from Miami? I'm uh, inferences on me. I'm paraphrasing. He says, not long thereafter, my friend Roy Black from Miami, then recently in the national news, because of his defense of William Kennedy Smith, called me and asked Lee, have I been hired without being consulted? Now, this is the New York Post. They're clearly not, I don't believe we're talking about Roy Black. This is the New York Post describing Johnny Cochran. Not Cochran takes over the lead. Black. Superstar Stella, Stella Superstar Bella said it was blurry. Okay, I'm going to zoom it in. I know it wasn't Zoom, it was facing me, but here you can read it here. So this is from the book. This is from F. Lee Bailey's book. He has his sources. He said the New York Post that we were just mentioning earlier, they said, quote, Black takes over lead in Simpson case. You can see it right there. DS, yes, essentially, this all, and Bailey talks about it in his book. This all was involving drugs. Uh, Faye Resnick, I remember Faye Resnick was Nicole's friend. She hung out around her a lot. And she was tied with drugs. Ron Goldman, if you read Pursuit of Exhibit 35, as well as Dr. Henry Johnson's book, uh, Double Cross for Blood, they go in depth about the John, Ron Goldman having a criminal file. He was an informant for the LAPD. They document this. They even have his informant number. And he had a criminal history. He had actually had warrants out for his arrest at the time of his death. Bench warrants for failure to miss court. I'm not sh shaming the dead. I'm presenting facts. And where you can get those facts 
I showed you the books to read. You could also, I played the documentary for you all. If you look and you can find online Serpents Rising, the O.J. Simpson case, they go in depth about the uh, evidence about that with Ron Goldman, the evidence being tampered. So there was a whole documentary on it that could be verified. Oh, if you are watching on Rumble, I got to say this. Can you please, please, please smash up the likes, smash up the likes, smash up the likes, ladies and gentlemen. Donate to the Cash App, PayPal, or Zelle. As you know, I am not monetized on this channel, but anything you would like to contribute or give would be appreciated. Um, I'm monetized on Rumble. I'm not monetized on YouTube. I need everybody to also, while they're doing this, I need you to hit that share button, hit that like button right now. Make sure you're hitting the notification bell if you're watching. Uh, come on, we got more. I know we can get more than 13 people in here. Boss of Queenie, what's up? So you all see this. This is from F. Lee Bailey's book. See, I'm bringing receipts. So F. Lee Bailey was the man who, honestly, he was also an unsung hero in the O.J. Simpson case because Johnny Cochran, as great as Johnny Cochran's closing argument and his direct examinations of the witnesses were, F. Lee Bailey was the one that got Mark Furman in hot water. His cross-examination, you know, F. Lee Bailey lost, a lot, a lot of people don't know this, but F. Lee Bailey got disbarred. I give my wife, I give people credit where credit is due. I give F. Lee Bailey credit. Yeah, he's white, but he was a great lawyer. He was outstanding. His motto was the defense never rests. He wrote his biography like that. The defense never rests. He fought diligently. Uh, for O.J. Simpson, and he has been adamant uh, till the day he died that O.J. Simpson could not and did not commit these murders. Uh, most importantly, if you read In Pursuit of Exhibit 35, they talk about the phone records. I mentioned this last night on Brother, uh, on TBA's, broadcast last night. Judith Brown had even stated that Nicole Brown Simpson was up past 11 o'clock. That was the last time they spoke. They have never turned over these phone records to the defense, even in the civil trial. See, they ignore all of this stuff. And what you have here, I'm going to put up another source. So this is Dr. Johnson's source, uh, not Dr. Johnson. This is Brother Thomas Johnson. So on the February 95 during the trial, Shapiro and Marsha Clark entered in a stipulation. Not to have basically as to the timeline. So the stipulation and all of the profit by Shapiro, profit means outside of the jury. On February 7th night, they do it, you know, in chambers. On February 7th, 1995, day 14 of the Simpson trial was the initial call displayed on the prosecutor's poster board, Exhibit 35, allegedly placed by Judith Brown from her home in Dana Point at 9.37 p.m. However, according to unsealed transcripts of remarks made in Judge Kathleen Kennedy Powell's, now she was the one that was there before Judge Ito, before Ito came along. There was a female judge, and I showed you that video uh, when there was the preliminary hearing. Remember, remember, Juditha Brown never testified and also 
the coroner who actually performed the autopsy on both Ron and Nicole. Uh, his name was Erwin Goldschwin. I showed the video. He stated emphatically, well, he stated, and he paused that there were at least two knife wounds from two separate wound, two separate knives could have been used because one knife that stabbed Goldman was double sided. The other knife, which Nicole was killed with, was a single bladed knife. So, according to unsealed court transcripts of remarks made in Judge Kathleen Kennedy Powell's chambers seven months earlier, Shapiro aggressively proffered a stipulation of the initial call phone call being at 10 17 p.m it was based upon alleged gt phone records that marsha clark waived while interrupting judge powell's announcement of an afternoon lunch break on june 30th 1994 day one of the preliminary hearing her animated action became the topic of news pundits that day but Judge Powell advised attorneys to review the GTE documents off the record and denied their public display in open court. On July 8, 1994, Marsha Clark feigned temporary amnesia in responding to Shapiro's proffer of a 10.17 p.m. stipulation. She now claimed to be unsure of what the GTE document stated regarding the time of the initial telephone call, to which Shapiro reminded her that there were documents that she had given to him before the video cameras in open court a week earlier. Judge Powell immediately sealed the closed chamber proceeding until the attorneys could reach a mutual agreement regarding the initial time of the Brown call. Three hours later in open court, Shapiro once again proffered to stipulate to 10 17 p.m., to which Marsha Clark promptly declined. The time of 10 17 p.m. phone call was reported in the following days, July 9, 1994, New York Daily News newspaper. They said they had forgotten it. They had gotten it from knowledgeable inside sources who the paper alleged had access to the phone records. Shapiro later stated that here it is. That Juditha Brown, mother of Nicole Brown, was initially adamant in telling both defense investigate investigators as well as himself that the last time she talked to her daughter was at approximately 11 p.m. Okay, so when there's a stipulation, I'm breaking it down for you. A stipulation is an agreement, essentially. It's an agreement between the defense and the prosecutor. We would stipulate, you know, for instance, and we do it all the time, especially when there are plea deals, if someone is being pleading to what we call a boycottable offense, the prosecutors will usually say we'll enter a stipulation that if upon uh, – if, if a, these matters were brought to trial, there's a factual basis of which there is evidence would prove that the defendant was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt as to this crime. And we would say we so stipulate on behalf of the defense, meaning we agree. So it's not uncommon. And so it, certain facts, especially even at trial, certain things as to a timeline, as to a period, as to if you ever saw a few good men, if you remember when Kevin Bacon's character was bringing in other witnesses and all these witnesses, especially who stated that the Lieutenant Kendrick told the men not to hurt, harm Santiago. And he was going to call all of these Marines who say, talk who were there at the meeting because Kevin, um, Tom Cruise's character was stating that the men were given a code red to give to Santiago. They were ordered by their superior to do so. And as such, Kevin Bacon was going to call his witnesses and say, no, that didn't happen. And so what Tom Cruise said, instead of calling all these witnesses, we'll stipulate that, yes, Kendrick said this and all of these men were there. However, we provided the prosecutors willing to stipulate that after this meeting occurred, no one was present to see Kendrick come talk to them otherwise. That they weren't there. All these men weren't present 
15 minutes later after this uh, uh, meeting took place. And Kevin Bacon so stipulated. So the jury, when they hear this, they have to stip agree to stipulate. Since that stipulation is rendered to the court, the court has to co-sign a stipulation. And so we're putting this out because New York Post is not but a racist piece of shit. And they got coons and buffoons right there on ESPN and CNN. And you know who I'm talking about. I'm going to get to him in a second. But I got to get back to this because this is important. So this is where I was talking about. This is where I get my sources. Because what they're trying to do is rewrite the history of the O.J. Simpson trial. And I remember this. And we cannot let them rewrite this. So he gets this information. It was reported again in Bob Shapiro's book, Search for Justice, that he has referenced here that 11 p.m., the reason why Juditha Brown knew it was 11 o'clock p.m. was because at the time of the call, when she got home, by the accurate time Juditha responded, she looked at the clock when she got home, and it said approximately 11 p.m. It would be up to Henry Johnson, Dr. Johnson, the chairman of the Ocean Medical Investigation Investigative Group, author of Double Cross for Blood, who would discover the irregularity of the official time of 9.37 p.m. entered as Exhibit 35. Dr. Johnson had been traveling between Los Angeles and San Diego for medical conferences on a regular monthly basis and pointed out it, that it took almost two hours. So this is key. It took two hours to get down to where the Browns lived in Orange County from Los Angeles. He said it was virtually impossible for the Browns to travel from the Brentwood area of Los Angeles to Dana Point, Orange County in the 45 to 60 minute time window created by the newly offered stipulation. So what we have, ladies and gentlemen, this time frame was created by the testimony of an employee witness who saw the Brown family leave that restaurant, we're talking about Mesa Luna, on Sunday, June 12, 1994. This was, they said they were departing at least at approximately 8.40 8.45 p.m., which would leave them about 52 to 57 minutes to arrive at Dana Point to make the 9.37 phone call back to Brentwood regarding the missing eyeglasses. He said the most routine and efficient route in 1994 for the Browns to travel between Brentwood and their seaside home in Dana Point was the I-45 and I-5 South Freeway. Under normal conditions, it could uh, it would be considered a 90-minute drive. Besides making several test runs ourselves, the 90-minute 90, the 90 commute was confirmed by the California Highway Patrolman Cal's tra uh, train traffic engineers, truckers, livery drivers, and more. So what they stated was based because the employee saw them at 840 and 845. But remember, remember on that day, that same day, remember what I showed you all? Let me get out of the book for a second. Remember the story about the cup of ice cream? <clears throat> Hold on. When Nicole Brown Simpson, and this was something I remember seeing. I remember seeing a cup of ice cream on the bathtub, the candles that were there, that was still lit. You see, that was crucial. The manager of the Ben and Jerry saw Nicole Brown Simpson and her children enter the ice cream parlor. He said the shop closes at 11 p.m. So I really don't recall what time we were in there. That was uh, Bill Chain who said this. So, but remember the ice cream was still partially, the ice cream wasn't melted. See, they leave this stuff out. They want to leave 
important stuff like this out. They didn't preserve, talk about the police officer, the cup of melting ice cream or check the temperature of the bath water, which would have given them sufficient time, which would have helped with the timeline. Because obviously, according to Cochran and prosecutor, they questioned risk officer Robert Risk about what he reported was a cardboard cup of ice cream from Ben and Jerry's found melting on a banister in a Coles condominium around 12.30 or 12.40 a.m. on June 13th. This is the article right here. See, I'm pulling receipts for Stephen Head Smith. I'm bringing receipts. And so your Stephen A. Smith, let's get to him right now. That's the same. This is about the ice cream cup. That article from San Francisco Gate. So New York Post puts this racist hit piece out, and they've put a lot of slander and stuff. They had one CNN commentator. I didn't even watch it, but they were going in, obviously, and the New York Post basically is a... to go why black people were cheering we were cheering black people were cheering for oj simpson not because two people were murdered like we have no disregard for the people that were killed yes we are compassionate people and we of course don't like seeing anyone get killed we also don't like seeing anybody get screwed over wrongfully and a son of the community whether he was doing some soft shoe cooning so y'all focus on the wrong thing about well oj was dating this white woman oj had this many y'all have had crush yeah and y'all know it crushes and secret relationships with people outside of the community that's not the point that's not what we should be focusing on we don't like to see somebody get railroaded and that's what should be the focus. And if a government official, like we saw what happened with Bill Cosby, if government officials can be corrupt in fabricating evidence on one person, yet alone somebody that's wealthy, think of the young brothers and sisters, but I'm especially talking about the brothers who don't have the money, who don't have the access, who don't have the resources, who don't have support. They can get screwed over. And we saw and know that they planted Evans. But let's talk about Stephen Head Smith. Because brother Tariq Nasheed was going in on him too, on his story. But we know that Stephen A. Smith, he's been adamant. I never, and I told y'all about him, how he thought. Rodney King, and so he thinks Rodney King was the Rodney King verdict was the reason why OJ got off in part with murder. So that's Stephen A. Smith. Somebody drew that. That's a good one. <laughs> and so yeah, New York Post had a lot of stuff. They say OJ's final insult. They're talking about his money and so forth and who is going to uh, believe it was reported he put it in a trust. And OJ Simpson's executors have state, he has an executor saying the Goldman family, Browns aren't getting a dime. Rightfully so. But this is what Stephen A. Smith had to say. And he also had Carl Douglas on his broadcast, but I'm going to play this. Uh, listen to this carefully. Okay, hold on. Fair use, by the way. I don't think so. So he's on with Lauren Coates. Without Rodney King. 
would there have been an OJ acquittal? Now, this that question just tells me that I don't think how so. biased this woman is. I don't to, think so. I think if Rodney King had not this had this, what mainstream media people. does. I got to interrupt. This is what they do. They muddy the waters. They try and bring up some bullshit rhetoric, not even focusing on the facts, not focusing. Notice nobody has talked about Mark Furman. If you look at the going back on OJ, the New York Post, I don't see one article, one comment about Mark Furman's role in this case. Or I don't know for sure, um, but I'm just of the mindset that had Rodney King not happened, then OJ, a not guilty verdict for OJ, probably would not have happened. And listen, oh, shit. when I think about Nicole Brown Simpson and I think about Ronald Goldman, especially Ronald Goldman, of course, both lives being lost so heart wrenching and what have you, you don't wish that on any you know, human being with any kind of soul. You don't wish that on anybody. Let's be clear about that. But to see Ronald Goldman's father, to know that he had no relationship with OJ and the perception is that he just came by and he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And to have that happen to him and for Nicole Brown Simpson to reportedly have it. Let me stop right there. He talked about how uh, Ron Goldman had no relationship with the, what happened with OJ and Nicole. Nicole Brown Simpson knew who Ron Goldman was. And I believe OJ even knew briefly who he was because uh, they had been friends and were in that circle. And OJ did not want to fund the drug. You know, they don't talk about Faye Resnick. That's another thing. But you mentioned Ron Goldman uh, here and Fred Goldman. Fred Goldman and Ron Goldman have been estranged, as Brother Harvey said. They weren't together because Ron, from what I know, Ron Goldman's mother married that lawyer. And his name escapes me right now. His name is, I think it's Marvin Glass. If I'm not mistaken, and Dr. Henry Johnson, his brother Thomas Johnson have talked, I've spoken with them before about it. This in their documentary, that guy has a lot of ties, let's just say, with some people in the underworld. Okay? A lot with drugs. And I already told you that Ron Goldman got busted for drugs. And look, that is not me saying because that they were in that life that they deserved what happened, that it was warranted. Absolutely not. We feel sorry for their loss. I understand, especially if I was the Brown, in the Browns' position or the Goldman's position and my son or my daughter were killed like that, I would want do everything to get justice. And yes, if the police told me this is the guy and this guy alone, probably because you know that it's the police department, you trust them and you believe they do everything right and by the book, they have this emphatically, they know this. You pr I probably would believe it too, but here's the thing. I also know that mistakes can happen in every profession. And there are corrupt people in our police departments. That is a fact of life. And they are especially biased towards black people. They don't know this. I think you mean Fred Goldman because Ron is deceased, boss. No, Rodney King and OJ had nothing to do with each other. But listen, had to endure what she endured from OJ for years. And then for that to happen, it, your heart just goes out to them. But unfortunately, at that particular moment in time, black folks were saying there's a lot of lives that have been lost from our community at the hands of transgressors who happen to be law enforcement officials. And that was a more pertinent and profound issue in the African-American community than OJ Simpson and Nicole Brown Simpson with Ronald Goldman. I mean, Jay-Z said it best when, you know, listen, we, we didn't have black folks. And I think, you you know, I, I don't want to speak for you, but it's hard to imagine that a black, a black person in America didn't remember OJ saying, I'm not black, I'm OJ. You know, he wasn't somebody that ingratiated himself with our community. You know, I'm not I'm not happy that the man is dead. I'm not happy that he passed away from cancer. I lost my mother to cancer in 2017. I, I'm very, very sensitive to that issue. I don't wish death upon anybody. But in the same breath, this was a man that had detached himself from his community. He was the first black athlete ever given a national ad camp. Where have you detached yourself from, Stephen A. Smith? See, people who live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. Because Stephen A., we still remember when your ass had to apologize to Michelle Beadle and to women across the country, when you defended Ray Rice, when you made those remarks about Ray Rice and that girl, and you had to tuck your tail in between your legs so you could keep your job at ESPN. Matter of fact, that's 10, we're talking about anniversaries of OJ. It's been 10 years since 
That happened, Stephen A. Smith. Campaign by Hertz in 1975. He prided himself on being different and separate and apart from his own race of people. These are facts. And so when you look at it from that perspective, and the only time it appeared he found his blackness was when he was indicted on double murder charges and he needed the support of the black community. You did have a lot of white folks in America looking at the black community like we were absolute fools for being supportive of him in any way because they knew that about him as much as we did. This is Stephen Head Smith. This asshole actually said this. Now, he had Carl Douglas on his show. And I don't want to get a copyright strike, but fair use. All this is fair use. Carl Douglas schooled Stephen A. Smith because, remember, Stephen A. Smith was the same one who said if he would have prosecuted, he would have never lost his case. Johnny Cochran would have never beat me. And we know Johnny Cochran went to school on Chris Darden. And Stephen A., you can put a copyright strike all you want, but here, it's fair use, buddy. It's being used for news purposes only. It's fair use on the Copyright Act of 1976. I'm going to play the, I'll play the audio. I want y'all to hear what Carl Douglas had to say because he goes in. Before I came on the case, certainly, I, like most of America, thought that O.J. was responsible for both murders. And then I spent 18 months of my life working on one case. And then I spent hours at a time getting to speak to the man, asking questions, and getting to know him better than I did. And I go away from this with two thoughts, Stephen A. One, the prosecution failed in their burden, not yeah. to prove whether O.J. was guilty or innocent. They failed in their burden to prove him guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, not by a preponderance of the evidence, but beyond a reasonable doubt. And another thing, Stephen, and I say, no matter what you or how you fall on the guilt or innocence scale, I will go to my grave believing that the Los Angeles Police Department and members of that department did something with the evidence to convict someone whom they thought was guilty. I'm a civil libertarian, my brother. And if the police can put their fingers on the scale to help convict O.J. Simpson, then none of us are safe. Right. Now, I'm going to rewind it, but I want to. So let me rewind it a little bit and go back because he introduces Carl Douglas. And then he asks Carl Douglas this question. Listen, with O.J. Team, with OJ team a defense attorney extraordinary, even now, I ask you this question. Now that O.J. has passed, are you willing to say that the man was guilty of double murder? It's funny, Stephen A., because everyone the last day or so has been asking me that same question. So he asked an attorney if he's willing to concede that O.J. was truly guilty of murder since he passed. An attorney is an attorney, attorney-client privilege. It's like priest to pent, it's like a priest to a parishioner or a doctor to a patient. That's sacred. Whatever is said between as attorney and his client. So Stephen A. Smith knows better. And Carl Douglas didn't play that game with him. And, and knowing you the way that I have over the last few years, I know I'm not going to move you from your position, but let me try anyway, as I often have in the past. Okay, the prosecution, led by Marsha Clark and Christopher Darden, clearly blew the case. She didn't want Christopher Darden to compel O.J. Simpson to try on a glove. He didn't listen. Clearly, that was a problem, okay? We also have to take into consideration, I think Officer Van Natter, if I remember correctly, I was listening to Alan Dershowitz on television last night talk about how he had tampered with evidence. There was an overwhelming level of evidence against O.J. Simpson, but as a defense attorney, the obligation is to present reasonable doubt where it's obviously available to to you and clearly the LAPD prone to misbehaving and prone to other transgressions that we don't need to get into at this particular moment in time, at least back in the nineties, they messed with the evidence and got caught. So that was the reasonable doubt. So I get where you're coming from. In that was enough to find him not guilty because clearly in the nineties, they still messed with evidence. They still do that today. They still do it today. I have cases I've seen where they don't make the, cha where the chain of custody is screwed up. So it didn't stop in the nineties. It was, there was a reasonable doubt, and that, that's all you have to create. That's not what I'm asking, though. I'm talking about the blood in the Bronco. I'm talking about the blood trail around the house. I'm talking about the blood on, on, on the shoes. Let's okay? forget the blood. Let's not forget, because here's another thing he gets wrong. Well, I should say he knows he gets wrong. That blood, those pictures of that came out after the fact. That evidence that was there, that wasn't there on June 13th, suddenly appeared on July 10th or June 17th.
He ignores all this stuff. The national media ignores all this stuff. White America ignores this stuff. You see this? This is Afro Elite. Hold on a second. I'm going to get back to Stephen A. That's what I'm talking about. Look. We bring in receipts. Attention to where you I see this. Now look at the one next. Now look at the next one. The one right next to it is from July 3rd. The one next to it is from July 3rd. I want you to look at now. They're trying to measure the, the length of it. Look at the fact that the blood spot, the little blood droppling, is in a completely different place on the same exact gate. So when they went there and they found the blood and took a picture of it, they went back after they got OJ's blood and they started sprinkling his blood all around Correct. the place. And it was like, oh, guys, Even we found the blood. This, we just didn't see it the first time. We found it the second time. See, Stephen A ain't gonna talk about that, but let's get back because Carl Douglas is talking. Hold on, let me get back to Carl. See, I'm bringing receipts. Yes, Van Adder with the blood, Furman just with the glove and the socks because there's video evidence of that. Judge Joe Brown even reminded me of it because there's video where they're filming in OJ's bedroom, and when you turn around, you don't see anything. There and then you hear a voice of a detective saying, Detective Furman, can you please leave? Because you know, first, you were the detective that hopped the fence first. You were the one that came to the house beforehand years ago to arrest OJ on a DV charge. And we find out you were not only a white supremacist, full blown, like they a full blown white supremacist, you were known. He was known to hate interracial marriages. The old saying is the only thing worse than I, I hate than an N-word is an N-word love, is a nigga lover. The only thing I hate worse than a nigga is a nigga lover. That's what white folks used to say. And still say. I shouldn't say used to. He's a horrible man, but guess what? Mark Furman has a job with Fox News. So let's go back. of O.J. Simpson. I'm talking about the DNA evidence that clearly shows he was at the scene. Are we willing to concede, even as he is gone now and, 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 and has to deal with the Lord for whatever transgressions he may or may not have done, are we willing to concede that the evidence definitely points to him being guilty? Well, certainly, Stephen A., I will concede because thank you for that major concession that you have just made. If I had been sitting on the civil jury two years later in Santa Monica Courthouse and the question asked was whether there is a preponderance of evidence, 50.01%, that he was responsible. I understand wholeheartedly how that jury could rule based on the evidence in the case that there was indeed more likely than not proof that was presented. But we're not in the civil arena talking about this particular case. And you cannot ignore the transgressions of the LAPD. Stephen A, it's like you have a big bowl of spaghetti, man, and you love it, and you're eating that spaghetti. And while eating that spaghetti, you come across a roach inside the spaghetti. Oh. It's do you keep eating that spaghetti, Stephen A, or do you throw out the entire bowl? You throw it out. This case was the biggest bowl of spaghetti I had ever seen in 40 years as being a lawyer. But there were roaches in that spaghetti. You had a detective who took the Fifth Amendment because he had lied under oath in a murder case. The jury came across those roaches, and rather than keeping to eat that spaghetti, they threw out the entire bowl. I commend them. They, they followed their oath, and they should be commended for what they did. Just for clarification for our audience, who was the person that took the Fifth? Was that Mark Furman? That's Mark Furman. OK, that's Mark Furman. Never in a murder case had I ever seen a primary detective take the Fifth Amendment, acknowledging that he was caught in a lie. That is a serious transgression that cannot be ignored. And who was the officer? Was I right in saying Van Natta, the officer that tampered with evidence, that was accused of tampering with evidence? There's one, one officer took a vial of blood from the crime scene out to Santa Monica. One officer was carrying sneakers in his car. There were scientific, scientific technicians that were bringing sheets from inside the house and covering the bodies, making for cross-contamination, picking up things with their bare hands and not using gloves. There was a plethora of issues that led the jury to conclude that he was innocent, Stephen A., but that the prosecution had failed in their burden to prove him guilty beyond a reasonable doubt.
OJ Made in America, the producers for that um, that docuseries, which was absolutely positively phenomenal, uh, you participated in that along with uh, prosecutor Marsha Clark because there were perspectives um, that both of you wanted to make sure was out there in terms of viewing the case through the lens of you guys going into the murder trial. You felt compelled to be involved in that. You wanted to give folks context as to what the times were like at that particular moment in the year 1995. Obviously, the murder was in 1994. The trial obviously took place throughout most of 1995. The backdrop from that was a few years earlier when Rodney King was just beaten to a pulp by the LAPD, which was a video the world saw. Paint the picture of the context going into the trial of the century, that of OJ on trial for double murder, what that was like for you and what that was like for the, the city of Los Angeles and the world knowing what was going on in the city of Los Angeles. Paint that picture for us, please. Sure, Stephen. I sat down with Ezra Edelman for five hours to talk about the world during the OJ Simpson Producer for OJ, made in America. Correct. In part because Johnny Cochran was no longer alive, so I felt it my honor, my, my obligation to stand up for him and his legacy. No one can understand or appreciate, Stephen A., the OJ Simpson verdict without understanding the context and the atmosphere of Los Angeles then. Not only had there been the Rodney King beating, but there had been the acquittal of those four officers in Centennial Valley. There had also been the death of Latasha Harlins, a 16-year-old high school student who was walking away from a shop owner and shot in the back of the head and then given probation. People who shoot dogs are given jail time, but she shot a black girl in the back of the head and was given probation. I dare say, Stephen A., you could stop any black person at random on the streets of Los Angeles in 1995, and they could give you an example of either themselves a family member or a friend who had been unfairly treated by the Los Angeles Police Department. It was in that atmosphere, coupled with the evidence that we uncovered, that Mark Furman had tried to file a workers' comp claim because he so hated black and brown suspects and prisoners that he would use abject violence against them. And he would use the N-word all the time, and though he denied it on the stand, we had several witnesses that could confirm it. So it was in that atmosphere that we were able to, to, to exploit the distrust that the African-American community held for members of the police department. And when that distrust was coupled with real evidence and real issues, they were open to the suggestion that something was wrong. It's not the way the community thinks of the police in Santa Monica or Beverly Hills or the West Side. It may not be the way that people think of the police in parts of Manhattan or New York City, but it was the circumstance and the cauldron in which this trial took place in the, in the, in the, in the year of 1995 in downtown Los Angeles. If Rodney, if the officers now listen to this. beat Rodney King watch this nigga on video, by the way, for the world to see. I got to salute Brother Harvey from Your World, who's on. What's up, Harvey? Matter of fact, let me do my Harvey impression since he's here. Beep. Beep. You know, ever since I seen Coonhead, Watermelon Head, Stephen Head Smith, y'all know he wrong. This this the worst thing. I got to lighten it up, y'all. No, this the worst thing since Jay-Z. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm not black, I'm OJ. Your, your boy. This was wrong. And so Stephen Head Smith is gonna talk to a lawyer, a trained lawyer, like Carl Douglas, trying to say that Rodney King was the reason OJ got off. This this boot licking coon, I, I swear to God. I had to do Harvey for a little bit, but I'm going to go ahead and finish playing. I want y'all to listen very closely. So Stephen A. Smith is asking Carl Douglas about Rodney King and whether O.J. would have gotten off. So listen very carefully. Pay attention. Before getting acquitted, by the way, if those officers had been found guilty, do you believe that the same jury would have found O.J. Simpson not guilty if those officers had not been acquitted? Stephen A., I was on the defense team, bruh. I thought we won because there was better lawyering, bruh. So whether Rodney King and the verdict had happened or not, the evidence was still the same. The lawyering on the defense side as opposed to the prosecution team was the same, and I believe the results would have been the same. Stephen A., you hear about the, the allegations that the defendants played the race card, the race card, the race card, but you forget that the prosecution brought on a black lawyer on the first day of trial that had never sat in the courtroom during six weeks of jury selection. Mm. They brought on a black lawyer because there was a black jury, and they played the race card. Now, he's talking about Chris Darton, apparently. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to tell you, get those books that I mentioned, guys, because that break down a lot. But essentially, yes, the prosecutors do the same thing. Hell, I'll take it a step further. Prosecutors across the country know this, especially when they have a black defendant. Their goal is to keep 
And this is why it's important to be registered to vote. For this reason, at least only, to vote two reasons. Vote in your local elections and to serve on jury duty because prosecutors do their damnedest to keep blacks off of a jury. Sometimes they can't hide it, especially if you live in a city like New Orleans, which is predominantly black. Same thing with Atlanta. But white prosecutors, I especially know this because I've seen video footage of them actually teaching other prosecutors how you keep blacks off the jury. And you have to, as a defense attorney, raise challenges with that. Now, for OJ, luckily for him, he had a predominantly black jury. And Marsha Clark, here was the thing. Marsha Clark believed that black women were going to be sympathetic to Nicole Brown Simpson because black women being the victims of domestic violence might be able to relate. Now, -uh. not when they were presented the evidence that they had. And of course, they brought in prior back evidence because they tried to say that OJ did this because he was a violent controlling, jealous ex-husband, even though we see from videos and pictures, OJ and Nicole were actually still hanging out together. They went to a movie premiere, his movie premiere back in March, about a few months before she was murdered. They are as a family with not just his children, not with just their children, but his oldest uh, children as well. Y'all forget too, OJ was married to a black woman, Marguerite, and that daughter, one of his daughters, I think her name was Arlen. I could be wrong. She died prematurely because she drowned in a, uh, she uh, almost drowned in a family pool and she suffered respiratory failure. They try to say he had no connection to the black community. He had black children. Yeah, he was cooning it up. I ain't gonna lie to you. Yeah, he did some stuff, but that don't mean it's right to see that he gets railroaded. A lot of people criticize Dr. Cosby for the stuff he said. I didn't agree with everything Dr. Cosby said with the pound cake speech. But you know why I've been adamant about defending that man? Because that man has put up, put his money where his mouth is. He's criticized black people, but you know what? He's also helped black people as well. When he gave monies to HBCUs, when he's had whether he created that show, A Different World, that showed the power of the HBCU, black fraternities, also uh, helping out Melvin Von Peebles when he made his movie Sleep Sweetback's Badass Song, giving him money, giving breaks to a uh, black stuntman association. Bill Cosby has done some stuff. He has done a lot. But I'm going to finish this. So Carl Douglas is laying in the Stephen A. Smith. In Los Angeles, if you are a trial lawyer and ignore the dynamics of race in this community, you will do so at your own peril as a lawyer. You're talking about Christopher Darden, and I'll get to him in a second. But before yeah. I get to him, what about Marsha Clark, uh, who, who was the lead prosecutor in this case? She, reading, doing my research, she wanted to provide a perspective herself. And one of the things that Edelman highlighted, OJ, Made in America, one of the things that was highlighted Eric, in one of the things I'm you sorry. talked about that you found shocking is that for some reason they believe I that having are. a female, Eric. a woman, as a prosecutor, that she was going to be relatable to the black women I know, on Arnell the jury. And I'm scratching Arnell my head like, I've seen alive. Martha Clark. The one thing that I can guarantee you is that she's not a black woman. Kids. Why would you assume with the climate that existed in the city of Los Angeles at that particular moment in time <laughs> that this woman would be more relatable to black females on the jury than, dare I say, a black woman or the black men that were opposite of her trying to defend O.J. Simpson. Wait, wait, did, you, did that shock you? Well, I know from having spoken to Marsha and read things over the last 30 years that in her history as a prosecutor, she had always been able to relate to African-American women. She would talk about the fact that they would often contact her after the trial and she would stay in contact with them. So she had that relationship that was contrary to her own jury consultant advisors. But she forgot to acknowledge, to acknowledge or understand that a black woman is the wife, the mother, the sister, the aunt of black men. And that sense would predominate because, as I said earlier, everybody in L.A. has an occasion when a friend, a colleague, or a family member has been treated unfairly by a police officer. So that dynamic of her history was the reason why she thought she could relate. Both sides had done focus groups, and we found and they knew that black women, surprisingly, counterintuitively, were the greatest supporters of O.J. Simpson, and they and they thought less of Nicole Brown, and basically that she was part of the problem. Why the hell did Christopher Darden 
decide to let OJ try on that glove? Because, bro, trial lawyers have big egos. Johnny Cochran in 1995 was the GOAT among the black legal community in Los Angeles. Chris Darden saw a chance to take down the man. He was a trash talker. He came into the courtroom talking trash that very first day. Chris Darden? You said Christopher Darden? Darden? Christopher Darden was talking trash to Johnny Cochran? And y'all? The very first day in the courtroom, when the lights were off, when the camera turned off, both of them would be talking trash. Chris Darden always talked trash. I, I'm, I'm, like, this, this is Stephen A, baby. This, this is me, Carl. Uh, 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 what did he say? Well, I, I want to know. Wait, when you say he was talking trash, I need to give me an example. What, what, what would he say? Get that man over there. He's guilty ass. What are we going to do? We're going to take his ass. Mm. It's funny, man, because Christopher Darden used to work in the department of the LAPD that would investigate officer-involved shootings. Johnny Cochran used to defend or, or I'm sorry, prosecute cops on behalf of victims of police abuse. So we had a great relationship because we always worked together in, in a civil and criminal way. He would never bring charges, but certainly he knew that our, our goals in terms of police misconduct were aligned. So the history was there. As a trial lawyer, Stephen, as you can imagine, you want to be on the free throw line with the ball in your hand and the clock running out. Mm -hmm. Chris Darden saw a moment, he thought, where he could take down the man. And this was his opportunity to show that OJ, in fact, was the murderer. If he and he fell flat on his ass. <laughs> Darden, Darden threw up at the conference after he lost. I'm not going to celebrate because I know so, two people died. Two people were murdered. But black people, especially if you're around, I was a nine-year-old kid when that verdict was read. We were not cheering. I got to read it. Applauding murder, a murderer. We were applauding a man who got a fair trial and was exonerated. And it was proven he was exonerated. So I don't give a damn about the New York Post. You can't fight with these people. But I am going to call out the New York Post because the New York, and Stephen A. Smith as well, because the New York Post knows about slander and libel. They know better. And they waited until this man died to do this because they weren't trying to, uh, they know that when someone dies, you can't sue them for defamation of character. But I can certainly point out if I were Justin, if I were Jason or any of the kids, anybody in his family, I would talk to my lawyer and I certainly would send a letter to the New York Post that I would want printed asking cease and desist and a retraction because my father was found not guilty whether you like it or not, white boy, you think he did it? That's your opinion. Guess what? Tough tits. Like Shawn Michaels told Bret Hart, tough titty in the kitty, but the milk is still good. Because we have the freedom of speech and the heartbreak kid loves the freedom of speech. Y'all remember that? Yeah, when Bret Hart was ranting on America and fans, whether they, you know, Bret Hart was about how fans weren't cheering him. Yeah, and he came out. Oh, Bill Maher. Bill Maher, um, that racist piece of shit. Him and Pierce Morgan. They've always said stuff. Pierce Morgan had a juror. I can't find that video. But if I can look at it, he had a juror on of the uh, OJ Simpson juror on, I think it was after the Trayvon Martin case. And the juror said, they asked him, why did you uh, not convict this man? And he said, if they presented the same evidence again, I would still acquit him. He said emphatically, the police planted his blood. At the trial, the tow truck driver who impounded the vehicle, as well as the limousine, the, uh, the tow truck driver, the detective at the impound facility, everybody that impounded the vehicle, imp that impounded the Bronco, they did not find any blood. You don't just wash and wipe blood away. Exactly. The look on their face was like a MasterCard commercial, priceless, when that verdict was read. I got to show y'all this. Look at, I got to, 
I got some memes of Carl Douglas too. I had one I did uh, when he did that interview with uh, for OJ Made in America. But look how Carl Douglas looks. <laughs> He's pissed off. <laughs> yeah. I got a screenshot that you ain't got my money. I got a screenshot this. You ain't got my money. <laughs> I want my fucking money. I want, <laughs> I want my money. Bitch, I have my money. <laughs> <laughs> How about this one? Uzi. <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all. I'm just laughing. <laughs> I just noticed it real quickly. Did you know the glove wasn't going to fit? Because I remember reading that he was taking medication and the ultimately you stopped because if you stopped then his fist would get bigger. What, what, what truth was there? Oh, Douglas, not even by no that. one had any concept that there would ever be a glove demonstration until the day of So anyone that said that OJ stopped taking medication <coughs> because of his arthritis. So his hands will be bigger is balderdash. I say we were going to have our own demonstration privately. Stephen A. We asked Judge Ito for permission at a lunch break for OJ, the glove, and a guard to be in the courtroom so that we could do our own demonstration. Because at a break, Johnny Cochran had gone up to the witness stand when the glove witness was on the stand, and he compared that glove to his hand. Mm. OJ had okay. massive hands. Got it. And after Johnny, Johnny thought it wouldn't fit his hand. Mm. He knew it wouldn't fit OJ's long fingers. But no one had any concept of that going on prior to that day. Last couple of questions, because I got to get on out of here. And thank you so much for your time, Carl Douglas. <laughs> um, <laughs> we sit here now that we've seen all of this. One of the moments that I remember was Christopher Darden up at the podium. Now, the I got to say this. And then the glove. Now, here's the thing. They tried to say that the glove had so much blood on it that it shrunk. Leather doesn't shrink when it's wet. Leather sh leather expands when it's wet. If anybody ever... And Stephen A. Smith lives on the East Coast. Harvey brought this up. Sean James even brought this up on his uh, O.J. Simpson video. Leather expands. It doesn't shrink. When it's wet, it shrinks when it's hot. Like most things shrink when it's, if you put something in the dryer, they tell you don't put those in the dryer because it's going to shrink. Let, let them air dry. So he talks about uh, Chris Darton. Lapsing practically in the arms of his colleagues from the prosecution's office. Why do you think that happened? Was, so was it because excited. the case was lost? Was it because he was embarrassed? Was it because they, they knew ultimately they just didn't do a good job of prosecuting O.J. Simpson? What do you think it was? I've known Chris for 35, 40 years. He fell into the arms of Mrs. Goldman because he understood he was responsible in that moment for the greatest defeat in his life. He was crushed by that verdict. He was crushed by the, the recriminations that he would feel in the black community, unfairly as it was, being a part of the prosecution team when most of black America, much of black America was supporting the verdict that took place. And in that moment, the crushing nature of that defeat caused him to fall into the hands of Mrs. Goldman. And to this day, more people comment negatively about that scene, almost as much as the, the failed love demonstration. Racial reckoning in America, not just in the city of Los Angeles, but nationwide in the aftermath of OJ being acquitted. You've been around for a long time. You've been in Los Angeles all of these years. Talk to us, this audience, as a closing remark from you about what times are like now with the LAPD, with law enforcement, period, with the racial reckoning of America compared to what it was prior to OJ being prosecuted for double murder. Stephen, it's regrettable that the more things change, the more they remain the same. And it is even more regrettable that our country is probably as divided in 2024, if not more so, along the racial corridors that we find ourselves than it was in 1995. We have all gone to separate corners these days, and we only speak to others who are with us and sharing the same viewpoints. Only when we come out of our corners and come together and have conversations is there ever going to be any true hope of dealing with the racial dynamics of this country, and they will continue to exist until we make changes for that. Defense attorney, 
for OJ Simpson, the one and only Carl Douglas right here on Stephen A. Smith Show of the Digital Airways of YouTube. My friend, I really, really appreciate you taking time, man. Thank you for joining me and enlightening us about the case and everything that surrounded it. Really right. appreciate it, man. Thank and you so much. Ever since OJ died, they're going to be on this rant about whether he got away with murder. So you can't let them change this. So Carl Douglas is a man who actually sat in the trial. He knows the facts of the case in and out. And as he stated, when you have the tampering of evidence by police, that was enough to give an acquittal, but also as to his innocence, I, I would reiterate, uh, a person is presumed innocent until proven guilty in America, and they can't change that. That's law. And when you're found not guilty, your presumption of innocence stands. Now, someone else who went in on OJ after he died, Mark Lamont Schill, Moist Lamont Shill, I should say. So he did a whole video. Shout out to O'Shea Duke Jackson. He broke this down. And he, I know he improperly listed this is why the pro-blacks are dissing O.J. Simpson in his passing. Mark Lamont Hill is not pro-black. Mark Lamont Hill is pro-democrat. As a hero, we shouldn't be talking about him as a martyr. We shouldn't even be talking about him as a football player. Now, if his kids want to do that, if his grandkids want to do that, if uh, people who love him want to do that, that's fine. And if you will personally want to do that, that's fine. But you can't hold us as a community accountable uh, or you can't demand from us a standard of care for O.J. Simpson that he has never demonstrated himself for anybody. Now, he says... What do I mean by that? In this video, well, O.J. Simpson is a bad person. O.J. Simpson... Listen. ...is not a person who is our kind. As the old folks say, everybody your color ain't your kind. This is the same nigga, this is the same nigga that was dissing Dr. Francis Quels, Cress Wilson when she died. This is the same one that threw Bill Cosby under the bus. O.J. Simpson became famous, moved to L.A., moved to Brentwood. And? I live in a nice neighborhood. And created a network. I, a lot of us want to live. Wait, hold on a second. Nobody, the goal is to move out of the ghetto, not to be a part of it. Ghetto isn't something we should be embracing. Nobody ever wants to forget where they come, should not forget what they come from. I agree with that. Never forget who you are, how you started, and the people that helped you. I agree wholeheartedly with that. But I don't have to stay in the projects. If I don't want to move out, that doesn't make me less black. If I got money and I was living in a rat roach, a rat infested, drug, uh, drug induced with uh, community, if I live like on skid area, like if you've been down to Los Angeles and I have, and this is no disrespect to my family in Los Angeles, we got it in New Orleans too. But there are certain areas you wouldn't want to live in in Los Angeles. It's like there's certain areas in New Orleans I wouldn't live in. Nobody wants to be in those areas in an unsafe community that's not gated. They don't have security and they got crime around you. Let's be real. You get money Friends, you buy what you don't have. He created a social network that was filled with white people. Filled with white people. Now, there's nothing wrong with having white friends. But O.J. Simpson didn't have white friends. He created a white reality. As somebody said, when he jumped in that Bronco, that white Bronco, and was running from the cops, Mark that was not the first time, as Michael Jackson said, that he used a white vehicle to escape a black reality. O.J. wanted no parts of black people. O.J. wanted no parts of the black community. Now, I'm not going to lie. When I first heard this, I heard about Mark Lamont Hill saying this, I felt that it was very distasteful. I felt that this is something that should not be talked about. It's been That's Brother O'Shea Duke Jackson. So let me stop right there. This is the guy that went in on Dr. Francis Crest Wilson when she's there. Yeah, Mark, Mark has been trying to get back in the good graces of CNN, but CNN won't have him back ever since he made those remarks about Israel in favor of Palestine, and he got fired. And Bill Cosby tried to get him fired or did get him successfully removed from Temple, and I can see why, because the guy is an asshole.
Right. I've been to L.A. I mean, in driving and look, that thing about the L.A. traffic, I experienced being out in L.A. last year. I don't know how y'all do it. Gridlocked. Everywhere you go, gridlocked. Homeless shelters. Homeless. I've seen, I seen camps everywhere. I was out on Santa Monica Boulevard to see homeless people on the pier. Eating stuff out of the tray. I mean. Come on. That's right, Harvey. He did work for Bill O'Reilly. And Tariq Nasheed, a lot of people were going in on him. But we ain't going, we should not ignore the New York Post, ladies and gentlemen, and what they say. I'm going to put the music back on. I want y'all to make sure y'all also donate to the Cash App, PayPal, Lazelle. Now, we can't ignore them. We can't ignore what they say. Now, because, and the reason why you can't is because. When they can say stuff like that about somebody that's dead, that just tells you the people who run things and are influencing your mind. That's how uh, that's what media has done. They have not changed in the last 30 years. That's what Jason Black was mentioning in his broadcast last night. They haven't changed and they're not going to change. You see, if you had if we had the money, if we had the money and resources to put a network together, we could actually support those. We should actually support each other to support our own and do things. But when you listen to them, they're going to tell you the story that they want you as the listener to read and understand. Now, I want to play this. I want to in other stuff I want to say. So hold on a second. I'm sorry. Some other stuff I want to talk about. I was watching this earlier. So anyway, some lightning news. They had the Coachella. Did they have Coachella already? There's this viral video. I don't know how. I don't know when this is. Or when this is dated. But there's a video going around. Hold on. Have y'all seen this unrelated to the OJ thing? Holly Weird is something else. Did y'all see this? This is Jaden Smith, Will Smith's son, and Justin Bieber. <coughs> Someone posted this. This was at Coachella. Jaden Smith comes behind Justin Bieber and starts humping. I'm like, now why am I not surprised? Is this the same Jaden Smith who said that Tyler, the creator, was his boyfriend? What is it with moist? I'm seeing this that earlier this week, Gerard Carmichael talked about how he wanted his white boyfriend to, to do like a slave master and slave thing. I. I think the, I think we gotta ask ourselves the question: Does money really make Negroes crazy? Is it the money? I'm convinced of that. If Mark Lamont Hill said that, I'd probably be convinced of it. This is nuts. This and Gerard, what's this? Uh, a woman's twerking uh, silence the crowd. Okay, whatever. That's the only way. Guys, if I have stuff like this, I'll be a multi-millionaire by now. I'd be monetized on X if I had stuff like that. But oh yeah, Nicole posted this. So I gotta listen to this. Yeah, but uh, that's one of Paul Mooney's comedy albums he had at least two comedy albums the one race which is in 93 that was his best one where he talked about uh the fly and stuff classic so i'm just seeing that yeah hollywood not for straight black people harvey 
not for straight black men. You got bass in the, your voice. They ain't going to like you. But yeah, they had, uh, yeah, y'all to get. Yeah. Paul Mooney's uh, Race. Yeah, his uh, Masterpiece album was outstanding. He did one on OJ, and he talked about Michael Jackson, like an hour and 30 minute. I think it was an hour and 30 minute uh, album. I used to listen to that when I was at Southern, and especially when I started in the comedy game, I would listen to Paul Mooney. I certainly had, I had a tr uh, Paul Mooney stuff. I had Dig uh, Red Fox. I had something from Richard Pryor. Those were during the LimeWire Bear Share days, which, uh, as y'all know, don't exist anymore. And Harvey, shout out to you. I saw you on Nicole ranting Friday. Yeah, but Gerard Carmichael, yeah, Gerard Carmichael, I'm more convinced he's a plant. OJ, did, he couldn't have been that fast. Look, I am get, don't get no blood all over. I have trouble eating a bean burrito. <laughs> <laughs> Is it a damn shame? And how many gloves does this nigga have? <laughs> they found the glove at Nicole's. They found the glove at his house. They found the glove in Chicago. They found the glove in Mississippi. They found the glove on the moon. How many goddamn gloves this nigga got? He just had a birthday in jail. You know I sent him a gift, a pair of gloves. That's a nigga you can use these. <laughs> OJ, OJ, you heard the jokes. You've heard the fucking jokes. OJ confessed. They squeezed it out of him. <laughs> OJ didn't do it. We know for sure. He was at Denny's trying to order some food. <laughs> Behind that, Denny's was uh, hit with a lot of uh, racial discrimination lawsuits in the 90s. But uh, Computer Robots asked, why was Nicole still using his last name? Uh, because she was divorced. It's not a requirement that spouses take each other's names, actually. So she was married to him. So she took his name. And, you know, that was the name of their children. You also got to remember, if you have the Simpson name with you at that time, uh, brother, computer robots, that was a lot of money. Obviously, that status is like, look at Tina Turner. Her and Ike Turner had been divorced. She still used that name. So they keep the married names. They keep the married names. No, Peg. I don't want you to have my name. Ah. I think Johnny Depp is lucky Amber Heard don't use his name. But look, we're going to roll up out of here anyway. I got to run to an event. But yeah, but it's been a great broadcast. I need to make sure you all are going to Rumble. Please go to Rumble now because after I know I've allowed it to come on because a lot of people are still uh subscribe to the youtube channel gboot2786 but i need more people to go over to rumble because i'm putting everything on there from now on um in the next few weeks since we have rumble set up so i can do more i need you to flock over there uh i'm gonna put the link if you have not subscribed to rumble i'm gonna just put a copy of the live stream for instance I'm going to put that in the chat where you all can go. I've copied the link here. 
So I'm about to put that in. So you can actually go there now and join Rumble. And shout out to your world. I'm sure he's going to be doing more. I'm going to chop up some videos. We might have to have, I've reached out to Dr. Henry Johnson, by the way, uh, earlier. I might, I'm trying to get him to come on the show, perhaps, so he could talk a little bit more about it. But yeah, he did a whole in-depth thing. And I'm sure tonight, uh, brother Tariq Nasheed is going to go in. They, of course, had their, um, they had the History Museum comedy show up there. There was a packed house, so uh, shout out to them. Hopefully, they'll have me up there one day. You know, I'm uh, I throw my stuff around, but if people don't invite me, if I'm not invited there, I just do what I'm doing. I'm making my own. I gotta tell y'all this before I get out of here. Before y'all leave, first off, the Cash App, PayPal. If you love me for my time, pay me for my time. My link was there. We had this past Saturday. Uh, I had, we had one of the best comedy shows that we've put on. I want to give a shout out to Wayne Ransom, B-Dub, Dory Dimples, Nonsense, my man, as well as Kyron Hargrove, Rough and Jokes, and the crew, and the, the crew behind The Verdict. The Verdict is run by Malika Honore and Keisha uh, and her, their staff, I thank them for having us come on. We do shows once a month. And, fam, I got to tell you, we ran probably one of the best comedy shows, uh, one of the best comedy shows in New Orleans, bar none. I, and I put my money where my mouth is. I don't lie. Y'all know me. We've put on, had some of the best comedians uh, that we, you know, the best comedians, the best shows. The vibe was great. The food was flowing. The food was good. Uh, everybody enjoyed themselves. So it was great. I'm going to post some pictures and some clips I'll put on Rumble. I'll even put on YouTube to throw up so everybody could take a look because I know people are there. But anyway, by the way, the SoundCloud cloud I just put in, that's from an uh, interview with Dr. Henry Johnson, who wrote the book Double Clock Cross for Blood. Y'all should listen to him. All right, fam, I'm going to get up out of here. Y'all be safe. Be one, be blessed. Thank you, Harvey, Boss of Queenie, Danielle Meyer, everybody. Tomorrow is Monday. Make it a good one. Let's start the week right. Yeah, Justin Bieber. <laughs> yeah, Usher's biggest mistake was Justin Bieber. All right. It, uh, I don't know if it was that or staying at Diddy House or marrying that uh, wife. Went up that, not this wife, but the one he divorced. I don't know which one he dislikes more, but damn, Justin Bieber probably was closer especially for my ears. Anyway, guys, be one, be safe, and be blessed.